not a big fan of parenting books, which I know is weird because I like write them. But but um, but I'm, the reason I'm not a big fan of them, uh, in it, not all, but it most, is that it worries me that that parents seem to be. Um, I think of it as D. Alford. A lot of the parenting books will um, will, in a sense, place the author or place the writers in the authority position and the parents therefore become um, de-authored and the books become what is important and then the, 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 the parent is standing on the, on, not on their own ground but on someone else's ideas and our kids are becoming more and more uh, clairsentient if you know what I mean, not clairvoyant but they can look right into our feeling life and know if we're standing on our own ground and know if we're not the little rotters they they know it and and uh, um, no honestly we can get one of my favorite stories of being faked out is that when i was a tween just approaching tween nine or ten year old even at that age my mother used to say to me um uh, uh kim john Payne, all, all three words go and pack your bag i'm calling the presbyterian police and the because i grew up in the presbyterian in, in the Scottish Presbyterian, I might add, the dark, the doer Presbyterian tradition. And so I'd go and get my bag, which was especially assigned for this, these occasions. And um, I've had therapy, it's okay now. But the, but the, um, and I'd go and get this bag and I would pack it. And then um, I would uh, walk down this long, long driveway. And there I'd wait for the Presbyterian po police. I know, you know, like... She just totally faked me out, right? I totally believed that that was happening. And I'd wait for them to come driving some kind of hearse or so, I don't know what. Um, but, and then she'd come down and say, well, you come back now. I've called them, they're not coming. And, and, and like, I was, I was good for hours, you know, after, after that. But can you imagine if you said to your your Kids, now let's say your your child comes to the sponsoring school tonight here, the, the Green Meadows School. Imagine saying to your child, um, it's a Waldorf school, so it would be her name, um, Gaia Rainbow Smith. <laughs> Gaia, go and pack your rainbow veil. I am calling the Waldorf police. Right? Can you imagine? She'd look at you, a 10-year-old girl now, and go, you are such a, oh my God, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> and it would she just, it's horrible that we can't fake our kids out like this anymore. It's a real drag, you know, because didn't you get faked out a little, just even a little bit by your parents? I, or is this just a terrible self-disclosure? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I was just really naive. But I was over and over. And then she would do it again. Six months later, she would do it again. And I would fall for it again. And this, this went on. And, and I'm, you know, it's just, I'm just about through it now. I'm over 50. You know, she can't do it to me anymore. But it took a while. It took a while. The, the, you just, the, our kids know if we're standing on our ground or not. And so tonight, in, in this presentation, I, I, I want to give information and I want to... Um, pass on uh, really solid wisdom to you about the discipline um, and about, about working with tweens at this age, but not as a parenting um, expert, but as more as a, I often think of it actually as a parenting troubadour because I do a lot of traveling and I gather these most amazing stories from parents and stories of triumph, stories of just a abysmal failure. I'm really interested in those. They make, make us all feel much better. Um, and, the, the, um, and then overcoming and moving forward, facing up to that, to that feeling of just inadequacy. And I want to share with you a bunch of stories about that, about, um, about disciplining kids at this age. Now, before doing that, though, I want to set a little bit of a context for the word discipline because you came out tonight for a talk on discipline, and so well, well done you, because it's, such a, it's often associated with a really grim, cold, steely, negative, just the word discipline, the fact that you're willing to come to this, good on you, you know, well, well done. 
because discipline has got a really bad connotation for many of us. What I'm suggesting is a couple of things. Firstly, that I've never met a disobedient child in all my life, ever. And I've worked with some right little rascals, I can tell you. As a school counselor, the rascals were my customers, they, they, right? But I've never met a disobedient kid in my life, ever. I've only ever met a disoriented one. I just don't believe in, disor in, in disobedience. I think it's, 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 it's a myth of the worst kind. It's, um, if, if we can see children when they, when they misbehave, and I will refer to tweens as children, but I've got two at home right now, and they still are children. Uh, would, you, would you agree? I mean, I think this, we, we don't have to call them teens and mess around with language. We can just call them children. Um, but the, um, every time a child misbehaves, so-called misbehaves, if I ask myself as a dad, what is it that you need to orient yourself? You know, what is, what, where are you feeling off? Where are you feeling out of sync? Where are you feeling just not quite yourself? How can I help orient you? If I ask myself that question when one of my kids is, is um, being fresh, being sullen, pushing back, whatever, just like your kids. My kids do it too. I'm not a perfect dad, for goodness sake. That would be a very dangerous claim, right? Should come with a health warning, like on the bottom of cigarette packages or something. You know, when, the, when they're pushing me back like that, if I can ask myself, what do you need to orient yourself? Then, then there's a trajectory shift. Something, something in the encounter between myself and, and, and my child then changes. And the thing that I've noticed changes the most is that I, I no longer take it personally. I'm, I'm, I've kind of hauled myself up and away from my sort of biographical Presbyterian doer Scottish roots. And now I'm talking from my space, not from some unresolved biographical space. Because it's the discipline stuff that, that forces us into a stress regress, isn't it? You know, sometimes as a parent, with discipline, you feel like, I don't know, you feel like the incredible shrinking adult. Do you, do you know what I mean? You just, you feel yourself just going back and, and then you hear yourself talking like your father or mother on a bad day when you were 14 and you swore you would never say those things. And there you are saying them almost in the voice that you, if you've had that kind of thing where you just move back. And what there's, a, there's two things, and this is the first one that can really um, set us on a trajectory. I don't think it, it, it's, it's some huge change in our, in, in our parenting, but it, it's a, I, I, you'll hear me talk about trajectory shift a lot. It starts moving us into a different direction, and the direction it moves us in is our own voice, finding our own ground, um, and our kids know it. Our kids know it when we're standing on our own ground, don't they? And, the, um, and if I can look at one of my kids and say, you are lost, you're really lost right now, what, do I, what can I do to help you orient? Then there's a shift. There's a shift where it's no, I, I don't take it personally anymore. And that disorientation, I think the reason that they are, um, they are uh, doing this is that they are pushing out against us because they're a little lost. I, I sometimes, some of you have been to previous talks of mine here, and thanks for coming back if you have, um, is that I, I think of this as pinging, a, a, a pinging principle. What I mean by pinging, just to, to explain that metaphor, is that when mariners are lost at sea or they want to take their bearings or a submarine uh, navigator wants to take bearings, they send out a sonic, I believe. It's a sonic ping. And, and it moves out and it hits, it needs to hit something, hit an object, and then it bounces back. And they send it out two or three times, not just once. And they send it out a couple of times and then they have their bearing. Now I think what our, what our kids are doing uh, to us is that they're pinging us with bad behavior, so-called bad behavior. They're sending out, so otherwise how could they do that really weird stuff like 
five feet away from us and deny it? I mean, we just stood there and watched them do it. Like, like, and they say, I did not. And you think, y yes, yes. S Sophie, I just saw you. I did not. And you think, am I raising it? It's like it's a psychopath. Like, like, you know, and you start thinking, well, there is mental illness in the father's family, you know. It's like, it's like no, I just watched her do it. And she's denying it. Oh, no. But, I, but really what I think is going on is that they're pinging us. They're sending out, they're sending out something and, and watching if we will stand firm. They're watching if we can stand on our own ground and address what the, the, the actual issue is. And they'll send out two or three pings. They'll often send out one ping towards their siblings. They'll send out one to mum, one to dad, or one to, if you're a single mum, uh, actually, I refuse to use that term. It's a double mum, for goodness sake. It's double shift, double everything. But anyway, if you're a double parent, they'll send it out twice. That's not such great news. But, the, but, the, um, but they, they do it, bless their, their little rascally hearts, they do it in order to know where they stand. And parents have said to me over the long years of, of, of uh, having the amazing privilege of meeting um, with y'all, I was in North Carolina recently, they really say that, y'all, um, meeting with y'all, is that, I know you don't say that in New York, by the way, um, but the, um, is, is that parents have said, this one piece about knowing our children are disoriented and that they're pushing out to be able to orient themselves, it not only prevents us from taking it personally, or at least helps us from, from not taking it personally, and having this sense of failure that they're behaving like that, what it also does is that it, it, it gives us a sort of a discernment about what action to take. It, it already has us thinking, what do I need to do? It already engages our will rather than just our hurt feelings. And that's a good thing, right? When your kids are pushing you to engage that kind of, um, that kind of heart and hands at once and not just feeling hurt or not just reacting. So that, that disorientation, that, 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 that this myth of disobedience. The second way I'd like to sort of shift the frame on discipline a little bit is to, is, um, to put uh, the idea to you that every time we apply discipline to our kids in a warm, uh, calm, and firm way, and we'll talk about that later, but every time we apply discipline in these these three ways. What we're doing is that we're defining family values. Now what I mean by that is that discipline can often be associated with creating distance or disconnect between a parent and a child. It's like this feeling of, oh no, I have to discipline her. Or you get home from work and your, your partner says to you, um, you know, when you're being working hard all day and you're being looking forward to getting home and you walk in the door and your partner says, go and talk to your son. And it's like, oh man, really? Really, I was hoping to play ball with him. You know, I was hoping to, really, do I have to go do that? Yes, I've been putting up with it for hours. And it's like, okay, you know. But the, the, and rather than have that sigh of, oh no, discipline, although I think we'll always kind of have that a little bit, but to know that when we apply discipline, we are clarifying family values. Every time we apply discipline, we clarify what we stand for as our little family. Not what necessarily what society stands for or what the school or what the church or what, no, maybe a little bit, but it's what we as a family stand for. It's like the metaphor again is, is one that some of you have heard me mention before, so forgive the repetition, but it's, it comes as, perhaps as a reminder to some and new to others, is that when I was preparing a seventh grade um, main lesson on the Renaissance, 
I was reading The Agony and the Ecstasy of Michelangelo, and I came across this amazing section. Some of you might know this, this quote or this, this, um, this kind of stanza in the book, but Michelangelo was asked, how could he possibly create, how could he carve the David, the statue of David? And his answer um, was, I, I didn't carve David. I had this image, and then I took away that which was not David. And he said, at times I could, because people would watch him carving David, apparently, and he would take really serious chunks. It was already beautiful, and he would put, he would put the, the mallet and chisel and whack, and a great big, and people apparently would, just could hardly watch in case something you know, dramatic happened, in it, and he broke it. But he was so sure when he just hit that chisel, he was so sure when he took that piece away that it would be okay because he had the archetypal image of David there and he was taking away the pieces that didn't, didn't jibe with that image that he had. Now the reason I'm using that metaphor, you may have you know, already put that together, is that every time we apply discipline in our family, what we're doing is taking away that which is not of our family values. Yeah? Every time they say a, a, a word that, 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 that like you think, whoa, where did that word come from? And it's almost like, gosh, they're picking up a lot of stuff from school. By the way, I've never met anyone who doesn't say that, so I don't know where they're picking it up from, by the way, but someone's saying it anyway, but not our kids, right? But the, but the, um, and it's like, um, if they say a word that is, like they say, for example, stupid is a word that's not, that, that's banned substance in my family, right? That's just a word we don't use. And we never have used that word. We ne we, and we don't use the word like. Our house is a like free zone. It's either, it's not like totally like random. It's not like anything. It either is or it isn't, you know? And, and even my girls, uh, even their friends drop the like when they come into the house because I, I kind of joke about it a lot. And um, they, they, it's, it's interesting how they can take what is a, almost like a speech tick and, and drop it. They just drop it. It's very interesting how they can do this. I'll come back to that later, actually. But this, this, if we can see discipline as a definer of family values and not as some cold, mean thing that's going on, then it, it in a sense, I think, has a chance of having us feel a bit more centered when we do it. Because if you're going to speak to your child about something that, that's gone on that hasn't been good, the only way you know that it's not good is that, is that it, it's grated against your family values. Otherwise, how, how would we know when to apply discipline, right? So even, and I'm, forgive me, I'm just sort of saying something very obvious, but, but the point is we can't apply discipline in any situation unless we know what is right, unless we know how we want it. So we've got a picture of our family values, whether we know it or not, and discipline actually clarifies that for us. That's the step one, right? If we're going to speak to our kids about using a word that is really disrespectful or treating their brother or sister in a way that was utterly not okay, we've got to have a picture of how we want them to treat each other in the first place. Only we often skip over that. It's just a gut thing and we're, we're going in, right? Oh, wish me luck, I'm going in. And then when we apply the discipline, if, if, if we can understand for ourselves as parents that we're applying it out of, out of a deep wish for our family to stand on really solid, good, healthy, respectful ground. Then what we do when we, when we speak to our kids will be standing on a great big bedrock of, of authenticity. You know, do you remember when your parents would say something to you a, 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 kind of uh, towards the sort of in the discipline kind of spectrum and they would say it and you would look up at them and you would think do I need to do that or don't I do you know there was like a cost benefit analysis going on a little bit and you would look at them and they if there was a certain kind of voice used then it would be like yep I better do that now do you, do you remember that one 
um, or sometimes not. Now, they didn't really mean it. I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. What I mean is that if we can hold these two things, that discipline is, is a, a, an attempt for our children to orient themselves, point one, and point two, that we're defining family values when we apply it, then it becomes a really important moment in, in the day, if we have to use. And there's seldom a day or two or three that go by where some guidance is not needed with our kids, small or large. But if we know when we're doing it that we're actually helping strengthen our family, point one is we'll be a little more careful what we say, right? It, it won't just burst out of us in some great big kind of angry uh, mess. We'll be a little more careful what we say. But I think we'll be standing on ground where our kids know that we mean it. And therefore, the kind of touch that we need can be lighter. We don't have to go in so heavy handed. If you're, if you're standing on big, old, firm ground of your, of your values, then, then what you say um, and the way you say it, then you're free to say it forcefully, to say it quietly, to say it anything in between. But one doesn't have to lose it in that moment. You don't have to lose the plot when you apply it. So those are the first, that, that's, and that's two points that will run all through uh, tonight's presentation. We'll have time for comments and questions too, of course, at the end. But the... Um, those two points are, are what I've been told are game changers. And um, it would almost be enough to just end there, but I am worried because we need to go more specifically about, about tweens. The, um, let's then just draw a line under that, that, that kind of thread, that, that warp, and now look at the weft of tonight's presentation because we're looking at, 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 the, at, at tween ages in, in particular. In order to do that, I want to put tweens in its context, first of all. And I want to talk about little kids and teenagers, but fairly briefly. And then, of course, spend by far the, our, our most um, amount of time on the tweenage years. Now, and the reason I'm going to talk about little kids and teenagers is that um, we need to, of course, know where our kids are going to. So there's a little bit of a heads up there. But... I want to talk about particularly about the first seven to nine years and the discipline in the first seven to nine years and give a, a bit of a picture of that because if our kids aren't doing so well around 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, then my firm uh, feeling about this is <clears throat> that we don't need to keep talking to our kids as teenagers and applying that kind of discipline what we need to do is default them back to aspects of an earlier stage. It, it's a regress. If, if, they're, if they're not able to cope with the freedoms of, of, that a teenager gets, which are more than a little kid, then it, it's not good to keep giving them those freedoms. I was saying to the faculty um, here a couple of days ago that I was trying to figure out with a dear friend of mine, um, Jack Petrash, I was trying to figure out um, when do you step in, when do you step back? And we were sharing our stories about our teaching life and about our parenting life and how hard it is to know when to step in and when to step back. It's a hard one, isn't it? And, and what we came to is it's not really a question of stepping in or stepping back. It's, it's a question of we're always holding our kids. We're always holding them. And when... They're, um, when they're little, we're holding them both physically but also emotionally and with our discipline fairly close. We're holding them close. When they get a little bit older, we don't have to hold them that way anymore. We can still give them a cuddle, of course, when they're, when they're teenagers, um, but we're holding them a little more loosely. And when they're teenagers, we're really holding them very lightly, hopefully, lightly. So, it, it, so it's not that when do you step in and when do you step back. That's too hard a question. It's in which way shall I hold my kids right now? What kind of holding do they need? Now, I want to take that into the practical and not leave that just as, a, as, a, as an image because 
I'm going to describe a little bit about the first nine years and discipline in the first nine years. It might help if you've got little kids too, by the way. That's, that could be a good thing. But I describe it because when our kids are tweens and they're not doing so well and we're giving them more space because, because we should, I think, give them more space and they're not doing so well, I'm going to be suggesting that we actually draw them in closer to, to, um, to a stage of discipline that they might need, they might not have entirely absorbed when they were little, and for three, four, five weeks or more, if needed, you actually bring them in close, just like you would a young child. And I say that not, not to be punitive in any sense, I say that again to orient them, because their pinging then will, will, will receive a kind of a, a boundary that they need. If they're, if they're behaving very, um, their, beha their behavior is very disrespectful and, and it goes on like this and it's a really bad patch and let's say they're um, 12, 13 in that kind of transition time and they're, and they're not doing so well, then it's not a mean thing to start pulling in the boundaries a little bit. I think it's one of the most helpful things one can do for a child because if you keep the boundaries there, they, 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 they don't know where they stand. Now, you can't default back to when they were two or three and treat them like they're two or three-year-olds, but it has, to be done, it has to be done respectfully. But for that reason, I'll talk about discipline for little kids, and then we'll go on to the tween ages and, and, and a very brief little couple of brushstrokes to the teens. Now, I want to frame this in three, three metaphors that will then move out of metaphor into the practical. When our children are little, I think we're in a, a governor's principle in the first seven to nine years, we're the governor. In the second phase, the tween phase, 10, 11, 12, 13, we're the gardener. Our gesture is more of that gardening gesture. And in the 15, 16, 17, 18 year old phase, we're entering more into a guide, a guide principle. So it moves from governor to gardener to guide. Now let me just go back and explain those, those metaphors a little bit. The first one is the governor, the benevolent dictator, yes? When our children are little, they really, they, they, I think most of us would agree, they really need us to, to be an authoritative figure in their lives. They, um, they need us in a sense, to, to be in this governorship, and I choose this word governorship, not randomly, because even on a neurological sense, that governance principle of the brain, the, the frontal lobe and the neocortex in particular, that part of our brain often gets referred to as the governance part of the brain. Right? It's able to hold a bigger picture. It's able to, to plan, to, to actually um, be able to... to uh, restrain impulse. It's able to, um, to live with anticipation rather than wanting it now. And, and our frontal lobes help us delay gratification. All, those, all that part of our being is what the child doesn't have when they're little. They don't, they don't have the ability to, to delay gratification. We know that, right? We all know that. Very little ability for that. Um, they don't have that neocortex and that frontal lobe activity nearly. Um, it's only very, very dimly awake. That's why giving children, when they're little, lots of choices is very troubling to me. It's, it's very troubling when I hear choices and choices and choices for children. And I think more and more parents are questioning giving little children, three, four, five, six, seven-year-olds, lots of choices. Um, and that whole sort of love and logic way of going about things. And, and because, in a sense, hitting, hitting is, is no longer allowed. Of course, you know, we, we all try not to do that. But, but shouting became the new hitting. And now explaining has become the new shouting. Do, do, you, know what I, do you know what I mean? And, the, and, the, um, and that kind of trying to be logical with a child, with a four-year-old, is just incredibly stupid. There, I've used that word. You know, it's just because they don't have the neurological ability to respond to it. 
and it makes them feel dumb and it make and, and it and it their behavior gets really antsy or goofy um, and they just fall on the ground in a puddle of Jonathanness, you know, and they just fall down. They just can't cope with all this logical stuff because the logical part of their brain is not functioning at all as it will be in, in later years. And so this, this, I remember once being out the front of my school, one of my favorite stories of being at the front of my school, and a mother of a, a first grader was in the first couple of weeks, actually, and she was a feisty little, little kid, but a good kid. And the mother said to her, now, Sophie, do you, want to, do you want to go to daddy's work and I'll drop you off? Do you want to go to Amanda's house? Do you want to go to the stables? Would you like to come with me to the space shuttle? Would you like to? I don't know. But there was this bewildering number of choices. And, the, and Sophie tightened up and she said, don't ask me. And the mother responded, and a good mum, she was trying hard, and I even knew what page she was up to on what book. Right? So she got down to her level, got down, and I'm thinking, I'm six foot, they're three, there's a reason. There's a reason for me being... Anyway, she gets down to her level, and she says, now, now Sophie, go to your feelings. Why don't you want me to ask you? Do you not want me to ask you because you're angry? Do you not want me to ask you because you're frustrated? She was, she was actually up to sort of chapter four. I knew exactly where she was up to. You name your child's feelings, right? Do you not want it? And the child st stiffened even more. I thought, here it comes, because I'd known this little one since the kindergarten, early day. And she grabbed her mama's wrists and she kicked her so hard. And she ran. And I thought, you go, girl. What a very sensible response. What a highly appropriate response. Because she was making Sophie feel crazy. She, she didn't have that capacity to make those decisions. She just didn't. And a lot of this whole thing about asking kids to make choices really early, like if you're walking down the beach and you've got your little, two little boys there and you're saying, now who would like the red bucket and who would like the yellow bucket, you're in trouble right now there. We haven't even got to the beach yet and the trouble started. Because some parents say, well, what about limited choices? I say, well, what about limited chaos? I mean, it's, it's like, it's just not a good thing to do. And it's very, very popular. It's very popular, these choices. Now, I am not in any way um, against choices for kids. It's a question of timing. Because what we're starting to do as a society is pack 20 years of child and youth development into the first five. And it's just not working. It's just too much. And it's overloading our kids. I remember there was one um, girl who came into my, into my clinic one day and there was a big rumpus out in the playroom, uh, out in the waiting room. And I, and I thought, what, what's that? And, and the normally unflappable... Um, uh, 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 receptionist, she'd been there a long time, and she popped her head through the door and said, Kim, I think you better see this family now. <laughs> and I, I said, oh, okay. So in they come. And this flaming auburn-haired girl came through the door, and she was in full flight, and followed by her very red-faced daddy. And the dad the dad was there. I thought, good dad. What a good, what a good guy, because it's normally mums and daughters. And by the way, it's great to see so many dads here tonight. Good, good, lucky kids, good for you. Anyway, and women too, but you always come to this stuff. <laughs> anyway, the, um, the, sorry, but you do. Um, but, but the, but the um, and she was saying, this girl, 14, auburn hair in full flight, saying, saying, you remember when I was little buddy, dad? Do you remember little buddy? Do you remember buddy? You would say, buddy, what, what about breakfast? What would you like for breakfast, buddy? Do you remember little buddy could choose like when she went to bed, dad? She was magnificent. She was just, just spectacularly rude. And, and she was, <laughs> I'd never met these people, by the way. I, got a, that was, I was morbidly fascinated with this exchange. And I was just sort of sitting there watching this. And, um, 
It's so funny to get paid for this. Anyway, the, the, um, and, the, the <laughs> and she was really going for it. She was, and she was saying, do you know, do you, do you remember we would go to the supermarket and little buddy could choose what was in the shopping basket if I wanted? Do you remember? Do you remember like we'd go to games and little buddy would sleep, fall asleep in a booth at the bar? Dad, remember? And she, oh boy. Anyway, she was saying, you don't trust me. You don't trust me. You don't trust me, do you? And she paused long enough for the dad to put together some syllables. You know, because we're guys, right? You just got, got to give a little bit of time. And she, she made the mistake of, of taking a breath because I thought she must be using like a didgeridoo method of something. Like she must be breathing and speaking at the same time because she's not stopping. I don't know, how do, you, how do women folk do this? They talk and speak, and it's like, when, when does the breath, anyway, I'm not sure when the breath gets taken, and she wasn't. She'd learned it already from her mum, I don't know, but she'd learned this art. Anyway, she paused. She hadn't quite got the art down yet. She paused, and the dad said, so, why don't I trust you? And she went, yeah, why don't, and she went, he went I don't trust you. It's not that I don't trust you. It's because you could get pregnant. And I jumped up and said, wrong answer. <laughs> Just, no, 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 wrong answer. He, and I said, he didn't mean that. She said, he did mean that. I did mean that. No, trust me, you didn't mean it, right? Because you you're going to have six months more therapy bills if you, if you don't say, I didn't mean that, right? The, the, um, I didn't say that. I was making that bit up. But, the, um, but that's what I was thinking. No, no, don't go there. But do you see what had happened? He had got it. I think the American saying is ass backwards. Do you see what he'd done? He'd parented a little kid with so many choices that by the time she had got to being 14, the genie was well out of the bottle. And she was a gregarious, uh, vivacious, gorgeous young girl. And, and the dad was really worried about her. And, she, and he wasn't, she wasn't being very respectful when he tried to put the boundaries that he should have been putting in place when she was little. Do you see how... And it was really hard because they were both great people and we had to work really hard to try and get that, put the genie back in the bottle, only she wasn't going in without a fight and she was waist deep in the bottle and she was still talking, you know. It was hard. And, and in a sense, a lot more parents are waking up to this, that there is a time for choices and there's a time for governance. And there is also a rescue package, by the way. I'll pause and we'll come back to that later. <laughs> um, but there really is, because it's never too late. It's totally not too late. But this thing about choices for little kids is, is really bad news. And it has a big effect in the tween years. Because if you give your kids a lot of choices when they're little, by the time they get to tweens, that genie is already starting to emerge, you see. That... that um, and, they, and they, they then have this growing sense of themselves, as they should, but then they start doing stuff that you think, I wasn't doing that till I was 16, and they're 12, and there's something wrong there. They shouldn't be asking to do that stuff. They shouldn't be doing. And, and there's something at a gut level that doesn't feel right about it, and our gut is right. But if the kids are raised on a steady diet of choices uh, when they're little, then we've exposed them to so much that by the time they're tweens, they're already now behaving like 16 or 17-year-olds and they're wanting stuff you would normally associate with a 17-year-old. And it just doesn't feel right to do that. And yet, you look around and, and most of the other kids in the class are getting that stuff. Most of them are getting the, 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 the iPhones, the iPads, the, the, all the different online... Um, presences, the, the Facebook, the Twitter account, they're all getting that and they're just in sixth grade, right? They're just in fifth, sixth, seventh grade and they're all getting this stuff and you think, am I just really out of step here? Because my gut is saying, you know what, I don't think that's really okay. But, but my head, I'm being told by everyone, it is okay, right? And that's just the way it is these days. I, I asked a dear friend of mine, Dee Coulter, um, if, we, if, the, if the pace of life continues as it is, if kids get access to so much information, if there's so much going on, can't the brain adapt? Can't it adapt? Can't, isn't it, aren't we okay? Aren't we? And she said, and, uh, well, 
maybe, yeah, the brain adapts, it's very plastic. And, then I, and, then, and she said, but we need a better question. I said, well, what about this? How long would it take our brains to adapt if we capped off the, the pace of life right now for kids with the amount of access they've got to all kinds of information and the speed at which life is going? And she, she leaned into some research about the, um, the neurology of that. She's a neuro she calls herself a neurologist for peace. Uh, she was at North Colorado State, and she's now at Naropa University. And she did the math on it, and she came back to me and saying, you know what, our the brain would adapt. Our kids will be perfectly fine. And she had a smile on her face, and I said, Dee, what's up? And she said, yep, if we capped the amount of information that they, that they have access to now through technology and the pace of life, our, our kids could actually absorb this perfectly well in about 900 years. 900 to 1,200 years they'd be good if there was not one single more advance in technology for the next nine to twelve hundred years if there was if there was not one more uh, scheduling over scheduling type of thing if 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 there were you know with this sort of you know parental arms race we find ourselves in um, if that was capped today then um, then yeah 900 years our kids in other words our kids are getting flooded. They're getting overwhelmed. And what's happening is into that overwhelm is coming two main responses, either pushback or fallback. Pushback is aggression. Fallback is depression. And more and more of the, of the um, very troubling psychological challenges and illnesses associated with 16, 17, 18-year-olds are now starting to come right into the, the 11, 12-year-old. Phase. More and more depression, more and more self-harm, uh, cutting, anorexia, more and more um, uh, drug experimentation. All this stuff that was associated with much later stages of development and particularly anxiety, generalized anxiety disorders, where our kids are nervous, jumpy, and hypervigilant, have a lot of trouble with sleep. All this stuff that we would associate with psychological challenges of the later teens are now coming, mo moving right back into the, the 10, 11, particularly 11, 12-year-old phase. A and these kids are being diagnosed with diagnosis that, that only in the last five to six years would we ever give a diagnosis like that to a young child. All sorts of diagnosis of bi bipolar, all sorts of adult diagnosis. And therefore, the adult medication is following. So more and more seven, uh, uh, 11, uh, 12, 13-year-old kids are being medicated for what we would absolutely associate with much later stage um, uh, mental health issues. And part of the reason, not the total reason, but part of the reason is that, is that the world is flooding the, our kids. It's flooding. It's the, see, our kids need a, need a balance between what is, what is coming to them from the outside, all the information that's coming through technology, the information, frankly, also from what we say, because many of, of adults in society now have lost, have lost the ability to bracket what you say in front of a child and what you don't say in front of a child. That is, that's largely a, a kind of a disappearing uh, art form, actually. Um, and the, what's happening is they're getting so much information, the pace of life is so fast for our teenagers that, that the, their little emerging ability that to, to meet the world, their, their, their senses of their, from the inside, for their little friendships, their little hopes, what they, they think they might be able to do, um, the, the, the schoolwork they've got to find a way to understand, um, family life, all the things from the inside, all the things that, that are warm and nurturing, that, that from the inside that would move out to meet the world. You know, as their little sense of self develops at 12, 13, they're a little stronger. They know who they are a little bit more and they're moving out into the world. Now they'll move out into the world like the little warriors they are, 12, 13, that's the warrior age. That's the Pippi Longstocking, the Huck Finn years, isn't it? That's, that's the age, it's the age of exploration. They'll want to move out and explore the world if the world actually is explorable and not vicious, booming, bum, uh, buzzing, scary, and just pounding on them. What child what, psychologically wants to move out into a world where everything's scary? 
right? That, that's just, that's, that's not going to happen. They'll want to escape from the world by moving into technology by mo and, and, and many other people. So my point here is that what's happening is, is that a young, if we can hold back the, what the world and hold back, or, you know, what's happening in Syria and with what's happening to global warming and we hold that back from our younger children, and just slowly, slowly, slowly introduce it, the rubber of that really hits the road around 12, 11, so 10, 11, 12. Because if we've held a lot of that stuff back from their lives, they'll feel confident to step out into the world at a time which is the exploration years. You see, they want to go and explore the world. That's, that's what many of us notice that, right, at 12, 13. They want to do things now a little bit on their own, don't they? They want to move out there on their own a little bit. And if our kids, if you've got kids who are 12, 13, who want to be moving out there on their own a little bit, then you can give yourself a jolly good pat on the back because that means you've raised them in a world that, that, that is explorable. That's a great thing. If, if your kids are uh, experiencing that, then you've worked hard for that. Because what I'm seeing is, is that, but I'm seeing the, 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 the shadow side of that, is a bunch of kids who are cynical and dissing about the world. They don't want to move out into it because they've had so much of it, they've been flooded. Because their little sense of, of self has been flooded by too much, too soon, too fast, too sexy, too young. And then th they're reticent to step out. They're, they're nervous about it. And many of the kids that I've treated over the years in my clinical practice um, for all kinds of, of, um, of issues, I mean, sometimes, like it's with the boys and girls, I've treated a ton of, of, of it's, it's like, it's, it's like the, there's a male and female counterpart. It's like the, 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 the female self-harm, anorexia, eating disorder, and so on, is the male counterpart to vandalism. Like there's male vandalism, it's like explicit, exploding anger, and then there's imploding anger, and it's not strictly along those lines, it's crossover. But I see, when I trace those kids' biographies, I trace often, so often, I trace that back to them just, just having just too much too soon was coming at them. Now all is not lost, because then all we need to do is just calm it all down. And yeah, we're playing catch up a little bit, but it's perfectly possible to catch up. But the recognition has got to come that there needs to be a ba basically a balance between what's coming from the outside in terms of schedules, in terms of adult conversation, in terms of media. That has to be balanced with a child's ability, little emerging creativity. Because a lot of people say, well, you know, there's a lot of creativity in the media. There's a lot of, but it's someone else's creativity. It is not your child's creativity. It's someone else's. And that goes by us a lot. We think this is such a creative medium, but it's not our kids' creativity. And what I'm suggesting is in the Huck Finn and Pippi, Pippi Longstocking years, that if we're to give them the ability to move out into those years, and if they've had a pretty busy, overwhelming life, it's not too late. We can still dial it back. Even at 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, we can still dial it back. It's amazing how quickly our kids get, get, the shape, get their shape back if we can ratchet back the overwhelming, booming and buzzing world. If we've got, and we can just say, you know what, that might be the new normal. The highly stressed child might be the new normal. That it's so ubiquitous, we've almost stopped noticing it. That might be, yeah, like uh, you know, my, my parent-in-laws, my brother, my grown-up brother, my sister might think I'm crazy, but we're dialing this back. We're, we're, we're dialing it back because my kids are coming up to their exploration years, <clears throat> and I want them to, to, to go out and explore and not disappear into, into video gaming or into being cynical, into dissing into, I want them to go out and explore the world. And for that reason, I'm going to dial back th the external world so that their internal world can go out to meet it, right? It's like there's too much sun, it's too bright, and it's withering and burning the little leaves of their soul. Their little, their little leaves are starting to unwind, and, and it's, it's just too intense. So 
I'm going to filter that stuff so that they're not because I don't want them to go out into the world. It's because I want them to go out into the world. It's the opposite, right? If, if we dial back all that booming and buzzing and pounding of the world, then our children will go out and explore it. it it's, it's a kind of a, do you, it's a little bit, is that a little bit counterintuitive? I'm not sure, but many parents are really getting on to this now. Thank you. Many parents are, are, are absolutely getting on to this, that, that something is, the saying is, out of whack, right? Something has gotten out of whack. Now, for us, as parents or, or parents approaching the tween years, the, 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 um, the real kind of expression of that is, is can our children go out into the world? Can they begin to explore? And it's crucial that they do. Therefore, the amount of world we give them has to be digestible. Otherwise, it's just, it's overwhelm and it's sensory indigestion and it's harmful. And who wants to, and what little kid is going to feel confident to do that? Now, the last little piece about the younger years is that in the younger years, in the first sort of up to sort of seven, eight, nine, <clears throat> around that time, our children need to learn impulse control. A lot of parents have said to me over the years that I've got a really strong-willed child, and I look, and sometimes it's true, but most of the time I look at a child and I see a child not with a strong will, but, but very poor impulse control. In fact, their will is fairly weak, to, to be honest. It's not a strong will at all. And what I'm suggesting is in the early years, we actually need our children to be able to um, creatively comply. They need compliance with what an adult directs them to do. They need to do this, not out of wishing to squash their, their, their freedom. It's actually just giving them the space they need, a playing field they can play on. It's, it's like when you see little kids playing on these massive great soccer fields and they're four or five years old and it just looks bizarre, right? They just can't fill up that space and they move around like little globular masses wherever the ball is. They can't fill that space. What I'm suggesting is when our children are young that their space is smaller, that, that, that they occupy in their lives. And I'm suggesting that they need to, to actually be able to do what they're directed to do. That it's very important for them to learn impulse control. And I'll give a few hints here, only because this is what we'll return to as a default if things aren't going well when they're 12. Right? Firstly, I think our little kids need to, to uh, a couple of examples here, and you, some of you have heard me say this before, is that they need to, they need to learn, for example, not to, uh, not to interrupt adult conversation, right? They just need to, they need to know that. They need to have a sense of timing. And if, like, if, if, I'm, if I'm talking to a friend, um, and I'm out front of the school, and I've come to pick up my kids, and both my friend and I work at home quite a lot, and we're down in the basement. We're men. We don't emerge out of our caves into the light very often, but there we are. We're at, we're at school, and we're talking in joined-up syllables and everything. And, we're, and we're, we're talking, and we're exchanging, you know, and we're th we're, we're just, it's important, you know. We're, 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 you know really, are the, are the heat going to go 23 without a loss? This is an important conversation, you know. And, and we're... We're, um, we're talking about this, and really, LeBron James could possibly go back to Cleveland? Never. He wouldn't do that. This is good stuff, right? We've, we've, we've graduated from power tools. Now we're talking about sports. And, the, and, the, and, and we're, we're, we're having a conversation. And now our little boy comes up, and, 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 and his mama has taught him to always say, excuse me. So he says, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And he's just, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And he's a serial interrupter. Right now, rather, and, and he's been raised in a the golden gift from God, and we'll turn right to him, and, and you know, and say, yeah, yes, Attila, what is it, dear? You know, like, like it's, it's he can't, <laughs> he can't wait, right? Now, what I'm suggesting is that if he comes up to you when he's little like that, you do the universal boom, hand up, and I mean high enough so he can't give you a high five, the little rotter, high up. Right? And, <laughs> and, and stop. And you, and you say, John, excuse me, I, 
I, I know, 23, uh, if they play the Knicks, it'll be 24. I, I know that. And you say, but, but I, can, I can see that, that James really needs my attention right now. Just forgive me a moment. I just need to see what he needs. It must be very important for him to interrupt. Blah, 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 blah. What you've done is you've said another few sentences and you've, wa you've, made, you've made James, the serial interrupter, wait 10 seconds. Did you see? 10 seconds. Hand up. He waits 10 seconds. James, what is it, love? Yep. Okay. Can't, no, we don't climb on top of it. We don't walk over the monkey bars, just underneath. Yeah, good. I'll watch. Yep, I'll watch. Okay, good. Off he goes. Now you get, and he comes back 10 minutes later, and he wants you to eat something else. Now hand up again, and you make him wait for 20 seconds. The next time, 30. Now you could say, isn't this animal training? And, and, and actually it is. It really is animal training because the animal within us all, the impulsiveness within us all, needs help. It really needs help to develop a strong will. I'm doing this to a child because I want him to be strong, not weak. A strong child can wait and wait and wait and then go for it. I remember being in Papua New Guinea watching an initiation ceremony and these 12-year-old these boys would stand with one foot and one hand on a spear with their head to the side and they would wait and they would wait and they would wait and the and animals would come closer and closer and then they would move like lightning. That's a 12-year-old who can do that. Neurologically they can do it and it's really important that they can do it. And we need to help our kids really little start educating them to, because at 12 that's a really important hunting skill for back, back thousands of years ago. But at 12 now, that's a really important academic skill, but it, more importantly, it's a very important friendship skill. It's really important. Kids who have impulse control can keep secrets. Um, a 12-year-old girl who can keep secrets is a very popular girl, right? Because she's unusual these days. Because what comes in goes out. What comes in goes out. That's the way it is. It's like instant connection. We can connect to like everybody all at once. And no, it, impulse control. And eventually, my kids, when I taught them this really young, and again, I'm not a perfect parent, but they would start circling me. They would start sort of like this. And, and they would wait, and they would wait for a pause, and then I would turn to my daughter, Safira, as my oldest one, and I'd say, Safira, thank you for waiting, love. That's really kind of you. Every single time, thank you for waiting. That's really kind of you. Thank you for waiting. Good for you. And then what's in it for them is our whole attention. Do you see? They get our whole attention. But you teach them timing, timing, timing. The, the, another thing that little kids um, really need to, I, I feel it's really helpful, is that as adults we need to know the difference between a request and a direction. A request is, shall we all get into the car? Right? And it doesn't work. Shall we all get into the car? They think we're asking. Right? And you might be a parent of a ward of kindergarten and you might, it doesn't work, so you might try singing it. Shall we all get into the car? Right? You might even try that one. And it's like, wow, it's like discipline Aikido. Wow, wow. Just right by them. No. Look at each other. No. No. We've got to know the difference between a request because a request is, is just a, a dressed up choice. It's another choice. As opposed to saying to a child very calmly but firmly, Sophie, it's time to get in the car now. You could, Sophie, it's time to get in the car. could be very kindly done. But it's a direction because directions give direction. <clears throat> Requests give choices. Instructions give inner structure. Requests give choices. And I'm suggesting that we switch to at least 80% direction, 20% request. Then our kids will do much better at school because no fourth grade teacher, no fifth, sixth grade teacher in the tween age years is going to say, fifth grade, who would like to put down their pencils? You know? It's like, it's not going to happen. We set them up on an educational train wreck with all these choices and all these requests. No, it needs to be a direction because a direction is a governance principle. We're giving a direction because we know the direction we need to go in. Another thing I, I, that, that, that I'm a really big fan of is what I call two-by-two two discipline, where, where you, when you give a direction, two feet on the ground, 
two feet away from the child. Two by two. You give a direction two feet away from a child, and not at their level. Uh, no, no, no. You just give the direction. It's kind. It's well meant. But the two feet on the ground, what I mean by that is that you, you're standing on your ground. You're not shuffling. You're not doing an on-the-fly request because our kids love on-the-fly requests. They love, like, think, think of getting out the school in the morning, get, getting into the car, getting to the bus, and you're saying, you know, Aaron, Aaron, would you like to put on your hat now? now Lizzie, Lizzie, come on, would you like to get in the car? Oh, Brendan, Brendan, don't you think it's time to clean up those blocks? And you're kind, right? You're kind, you're kind. And you get in the car, and you sit there like, okay, and you look behind you, no one. <laughs> no one's there. It's discipline Aikido again. Wow, wow. They've had to do not a thing because we've been on the move, on the move, on the move. Our kids love that because they have to do nothing. It's very popular amongst kids, that thing. What I'm suggesting is two by two, two feet down, two feet away, and we give the direction. And for every 10 or 20 two by two, as you get a 20 footer for, for free, you get it free. You might call up the, 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 the stairs up, upstairs, boys, supper time, because they know if they don't come, you'll do another one of those weird two by two things. Two feet down, two feet away, <coughs> give the instruction. It's amazing what that can do because you're connecting. And, and a, a good friend of my colleague, Gordon Neufeld, uh, who wrote Hold On To Your Kids, he has this saying, connect before you direct. You connect first. When you're on the fly, when you're moving, giving a series of vague requests, that is not connecting. You connect, say, you, know, you say, Jonathan, come here. I want, to, I want to now let you know what we're doing next. No, 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 Jonathan, here. Okay. And you just know when he's ready. His eyes stop rolling. He stops fidgeting. He stop. Yeah, that's it, Jonathan. And my evil little one, come sit on my lap. An older one. Now, in just a few minutes, we're going to put on coats, and then we're getting into the car. And yep, yep, you can count the number of trucks again on the way. You see, you'll see many trucks. How many was it last time? More than ten. That's right. Do you see what you see? What you've done? You've connected and you've directed. Now there's many more tips besides on this whole theme, but I just wanted to give a couple of ideas, a flavor of that benevolent dictator. <clears throat> and lastly, before we move into the, the entire rest of our time on the tweens, and, and you'll see why I've spent more, more time on this in a moment, but is that one of the things that Ronald Morris wrote about in the 12 Keys of Discipline that I've added to, I want to talk about the five, these five keys that I think five core values, is that when you give a child an instruction, first of all, you pause and picture what it is you're asking them to do. The first thing is pause, just for a couple of heartbeats. There's no, don't light candles and sway in the wind and smudge the room or anything. Just, just, just quick pause. I mean, you might want to smudge something if you must, but just, just a quick pause. And then picture that what the instruction that you're given, giving being done really well. Now I've lent it, leaned into years of neurological interest uh, to, 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 to learn this for myself because when I picture, if I'm going to say to my child, we're, go, we're now, um, Johanna, we're going to empty the compost, love. If I picture that compost or that table being set, Johanna, we're going to set the table now. If I pause for a heartbeat and picture the table being set beautifully, what I've done is I've come into my limbic system and I'm much surer and I'm not so, um, I'm not so unsure about what I'm going to, and then I go into the, a request. I might say, uh, Johanna, we're going to set the table now. And then I start, mm, okay. I just end it with this little, like, oh, I'm sunk, right? No, when I picture something and I picture it being done well, then I, my, the ground under my feet starts to become strong. You picture it. So you pause and picture it. Okay. Johanna, we're going to set the table now. It's time to set the table. That's right. And if she's not with me doing it, say, then the first one is pause and picture. And the second one is start small. If a child pushes back against a, an instruction, say, well, I, hang on, love. Oh, I know, it's hard. It takes such a long time. This is a you know, four-year-old. 
she, Johanna has been setting the table since she's been 18 months old, right? And, oh, man, it took so long to do this. And we did it from 18 months through to about three. And at three, she did it herself. And now she's 11, and we just say nothing. She just sets the table, and it's done. The, 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 the yield from that one and a half years of, I could do this so much quicker on my own. You know, the, 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 the benefit from that has been significant. I get to read Sports Illustrated now when it's time to set the table, right? I've got a friend at Sports Illustrated and I get the copies for free. I've got a lot of them, right? So, the, um, so it's pause, but start small. And if she says no or starts to grizzle, say, oh, you know what? Let's just put the, point, the forks out because they're pointy ones and I know you like the pointy ones. Let's, let's put the pointy ones out and not set the table because that's too big for her but I just dial it back and break the direction down into its <laughs> component parts. That's good. Now let's, let's, let's put the water out. Yeah, we can float some boats uh, in the sink at, w w before we do it. And I'm thinking, man, I just want to get the water on the table. And we've got boats. And, but, you know, but still. And we, we get the... But st pause, picture, start small. Number two. Number three. Number three is stay close. When you give an instruction, stay really physically close to a child. Don't walk away. Don't give an instruction and then walk away. They're slippery little customers. You walk away, they're out of there, right? They're gone. Where did they go so quick? So, so number three is stay close. Number four is insist. Absolutely insist. No negotiation. No way under me, no way, no way over me. No way around me. My fatherly will will be done in this family as it is in heaven. This is going to happen. It's great to have a wooden podium. It's going to happen. Right? No negotiation. Because our kids can say, well, why do I have to? Like, like Brendan doesn't have to. No, you're wrong. When Brendan was your age, he had to do this. Yeah, but, but why does... And you, you're sunk. You're sunk. Just flatline it. Broken record. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, Miguel. It's just, we're going to set the table. Uh-uh, we're going to set the table. No, no, like this. Not like that, like this. No, nope, we're going to set the table. No, 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 like this. Be so boring about it. Be really, really boring about it. And then the last one is follow through. Really follow through. Don't get distracted. If the UPS guy comes, if the pager goes off, if, you, if the cell phone goes off, just stay with it. Because unless we follow through and follow through, now sometimes the follow through will mean a child has a meltdown. They don't want to do it. They're laying on the ground. They're kicking. They're, they're not going to do it. Well, then, okay, to say, Miguel, you know what? This is not a good time to do it. Uh, uh, Daddy's, Daddy's choosing to actually just let the table be for a little while and we'll come back to it. Because I don't want to you know, be ridiculous about this. But then, 10 minutes later, okay, Miguel, let's put the knives on now. You follow through. Pause and picture, number one. Start small, number two. Stay close, number three. Insist, absolutely insist. No negotiation, number four. And number five, follow through. These, these, for me, are the keys to raising a young child. Very, very few choices. Just a child who has strong impulse control. Now, let's now turn... Thanks for sitting through that. And this will bear fruit. You, you'll, see, you'll see why. Because the, now in the, the teenage years, a child who's had a big old foundation set of impulse control is going to be a child in the tween years who does pretty well. Now, here are the keys to the tween years in terms of discipline. I'll nutshell them, and then we'll come back and, and dig in a little bit. A, to a teenager, to a 9, 10-year-old, 11-year-old, I want to be saying, first of all, I want to be this, in this gardening principle. Now, the gardener, let me explain the gardener. The reason I use that metaphor is a gardener watches the soil, the gardener watches the sky, he, he, he listens, she watches, and then when the time is right, she plants or she harvests. But there's a watching, a listening, a working with. 
and you're not forcing the soil to do things you're working with, but then you make a decision. And I think this is a really sort of accurate metaphor for, um, for, for young kids because they, they don't need the benevolent dictator. A 12-year-old does not need that anymore. You don't want to be doing that um, because it's just it's inappropriate and they'll push and they'll rail against it and it's just it's not very nice for them. If they've, if they've learned to control their impulses, if they've learned to comply, they've learned because in a child who's learned to comply begins what translates where that metamorphoses into is a child who can hold back. And in order to have empathy, and this is the 12 year old key word is empathy. In order for a child to have empathy for another person, they have to hold back their own space to honor another person's space. Do, do you see? We want our kids to be empathetic, but how can they be empathetic if we never teach them impulse control? Because they're always just ba basically caught up with their own impulses. We teach our kids impulse control, then they can build on that to have empathy. Then they'll have empathy for their brothers and sisters. Then they can have empathy for, for what mum's needs are, what dad's needs are. But it begins with impulse control, and a lot of people miss this, and it's very helpful to know it. And if the kids don't have very good impulse control, they need to learn it. We need to back up and teach them, and then come forward again. But, but a healthy, typical 12-year-old, one will be able to say to that 12-year-old, to and here's the key words here now, is, is what's your plan? I can't tell you how many times my kids have heard that in their teenage years, is tell me your plan, love. What is it? And they know that I will sit and I will listen. And so will Catherine, my wife. We will sit, we'll listen to them, we'll take them <coughs> really seriously. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not a, a random thing. We're not playing games. It's not just parenting sort of style. We're not manipulating them. We truly want to hear their plan, and they know it. And we'll say, okay, because they know they can tell us their plan, and we've shifted our parenting style from being a governor when they were little because now they're, they're perfectly able to say their plan. They're not always great plans. Like... Um, a little while ago, my daughter said to me, well, look, can I, can I like, I want to have a sleepover at Maria's and like, it's Thursday night, Friday and Saturday and I know, Daddy, I know that's a lot of sleepovers, but we've got a reason for it. And she, and she said, the, um, the reason for it is that, is that Thursday night that we're both like doing chemistry at the moment and it's really hard and I want to stay over with, with, with Maria because she's really good at it and we're going to do our homework. And then on Friday night, well, Friday night, that's just Friday night and we can stay over and then we'll be so like just really into it and the bedroom will all be set up and everything. We may as well just stay Saturday too. <laughs> yeah. It's really great. It's like, it's like, I don't think so. But she's, but she's, she's saying this. Now we'll add it into the I don't think so is that Maria's sister, older sister, her 17-year-old sister, is a full-blown goth, yeah? just barely, barely drawing breath. <laughs> and her boyfriend is a 28-year-old um, Marilyn Manson look-alike. And, and, and Maria is a bit of a gothling, actually, I've got to say, um, as well, her friend. But my daughter says, you know, but, but Daddy, um, Drusilla, I don't, can't remember her name, but um, Drusilla um, won't, <laughs> won't be there on Thursday night. It's okay. And that kind of music and those, like, you know, all those, those movies and stuff, because they're, you know, they're pretty grotesque. They're not going to be there, and it's fine. Because she knows. I don't know, I don't know how she knows that I, I'm not real fond of Drusilla and, and the Count, um, her, 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 her boyfriend, you know. But, but, um, but, but, you know, she knows. And so I say, okay, love, that's good. Let me, let me think about that for a minute. And she knows, because from the youngest time when she knew her, her letters, she knows that a now answer, spelled N-O-W, when she first learned her letters, N-O-W, a now, if, if, if ever my kids want a now answer, they may have it, but it's N-O-W minus the W. It's always no. 
Because I've, I've, if they really want to push me for a now answer, it's got to be no, because my, no, my now responses are always my worst. I give my, you know, I just always regret the, the, the responses I give on the spot without just thinking about it, even for, even for 30 seconds or so. So she knows to wait. I go away, talk with Catherine, come back, and say to her, Safira, you know what, love? Thursday night's not a good idea, but, fr and, but hang on. Friday's going to work really well. Friday's really fine, and, and you'll be fine with Drusilla and the Count. You know how to cope with all that. You, you, and she says, well, I do actually, Daddy. I'm like, I know you do, love. And she says, we don't, we don't even like all that. And I say, I know, it's fine. And then Saturday, what about you sleep in the snow fort at our place, right? Um, really? We could sleep? I, I asked, yeah, yeah, we've still got enough snow. We can do that. We've had a lot of snow in Northampton, Massachusetts. Oh, man, we've had a lot. Anyway, there's still the snow forts. Yeah, we could sleep in the snow fort. Really? And so, do you see what I've done? And I've said, but hang on, love. The reason Friday and Saturday are okay is that you really had a good plan there. Well done, you. And she goes away. And she's not embarrassed. She's not goofy. She gets a little praise for that because she deserved it. It was a good plan. Little kids can do this, but here's the thing. Is, and I know in the United States when you say, here's the thing, you've got to say something good, right? So here's the thing. Is, is the thing is, it's not just tell me your plan. It's tell me your plan and make it take three things into account. And again, my kids have heard this endlessly. Tell me your plan, good. But number one is be respectful. Because if you tell me your plan and you get fresh and antsy and disrespectful, hello, governor. Right? Welcome back into the governor's mansion. I'm going to tell you just exactly what's going to be what here. Oh, Dad, I'm not a baby. I know. Do you want to think about telling me your plan respectfully? <coughs> okay. And then she backs up and goes into a respectful plan. Otherwise, she's meeting Mr. Schwarzenegger you know, in the governor's mansion. I don't mean the Terminator. <laughs> Although, you know. Um, the <laughs> yeah. Um, so... Okay, that's number one. Tell me your plan, but tell me respectfully, number one. Number two is that use good timing. Don't tell me a plan while I'm, while I'm heading off to coach the basketball team. You know, like we're getting all our kit together. We're getting, I'm pumping up the balls. Don't come and talk to me while I'm trying to pump up 13 balls, which I should have done last night, and Catherine told me to, but I didn't, and now I'm trying to do this, and don't come and tell me your plan then. All right, timing. Tell me your plan at the right time. Now, often kids don't know about this, so they can ask, is this the right time, Daddy? It's like there is music to a parent's ears. Is this the right time? What a great quality. I mean, really, you think, you just, you're tempted to think, I'm a really good parent, but you don't because you know that it's going to really screw up later on. But, okay, make sure the timing is good. And thirdly, you've got to make your plan taking into account the rest of the family. Don't make a plan that is all about you. If you make a plan, like if you sleep at, at Maria's house on Friday, that's, that's perfectly fine, but what's going to happen to your little sister? Because she'd planned to go to the park with you to, to actually, finally, there's a, they've, they've plowed the basketball um, court, and you're going to play some basketball. So what's happening to that? Well, we could still do it because she, you know, and, okay, good. You're good to go. And, and, or, and who's driving you, or is that okay with, and so the plan comes, but it's got to take other kids in, cause, uh, into, into account and other family members into account. So again, w what's your plan? Tell it respectfully. Tell it with good timing and tell it taking others into account. If those bases, and you've got to remind the kids of those four bases, batter up, first base, batter up is tell me your plan. We're rounding the bases, like really just first base is, is tell me respectfully. You, you can't even get going if it's disrespectful, right? Second base, tell me with, 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 at a good time. Third base, heading into home, into the home stretch. You're rounding third and at the, into home once it's done respectfully once it's done with really taking other kids into consideration, brother, sister, mother, even friends, parents, like who's going to drive you. This for me is the key to discipline of a 12-year-old, of a 
is, that, is to be really proactive and back them up before you even need the discipline, before you even need to apply it. Because one of the things that, uh, if you can inwardly picture telling this to your 12-year-old, to your if you can inwardly picture having this kind of conversation, is that, is that they like it. They like it a lot that you're listening to them. And actually, secretly, they like it a lot that you're still making the decision. I, I, I can tell. I can tell. Even my daughter going, into four, uh, going on to 14 now, she still likes it when I just say, you know, I think this is the way it's going to be best. This is what we're doing. Now, when she's 16, am I going to be doing that? Completely not. I am not going to be doing that. And I want to just put a couple of brush strokes. When she's 16, I'm going to be asking her. I want to talk to her. I've already got an idea of where she's going in her life. She loves animals. She's talking about being a vet even now or a farmer or a, whatever she does in her life. She's already illustrating. She's il il illustrating. Actually, she's likely to illustrate my next book. And she's, she's a phenomenal drawer. Um, she spends a lot of time drawing because there's no TV at home, so she's got to do something, you know. So she draws, and illustrates. <coughs> but the um, so when my daughter's 16, or when your daughter or your son is 16, the conversation has got to be around if something goes wrong, they go to a party and there's alcohol at the party, or they go to a party and there's 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 been some pretty promiscuous activity that you've heard about through the other parents, or or there's a series of behaviors at school that you're getting wind of from her friends, and maybe he or she's not even involved. And you, and, but they're his friends, and he's on the edges of it, and you're worried. You know, it's, it's not good. There's been a kid suspended, and it wasn't your son, and thank goodness, but... Right, so you got, And to have the conversation after that party, for example, where there's alcohol, and say, hey, you know, Dwight, you're, you're talking about, you're, 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 you've got real plans for, um, for architectural stuff. You, you're great at drafting. You really love building. You've got these plans to go in that direction. You know, and, you, and you've got whole ideas about what you want to do in the world and where you want to take that into the developing world. I mean, I think that's fabulous. Because slowly, 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 you've built up what it is your child wants to do in the world as they grow out into the world. And the key question with a teenager, I've had some fabulous conversations with teenagers when I say to them, was that going in your direction? Was that furthering what you want to bring to the world, what you want to do in the world, or was that a cross-town bus? Did that take you forward or take you away from where you want to go? That's the conversation with a teenager. I don't want to talk with a teenager about what I think. They're dramatically, spectacularly disinterested in that. Right? I want to have a conversation about their direction. And that's the guide. Do you see? The guide knows the terrain. The guide, and also, what I want to have a conversation with about a teenager. Now, if you've got kids who are 14 into 15, this is the kind of cusp of this conversation. Because 13, 14, 15 are the risk-taking years. And the conversations that I've had with countless kids at this age have been, OK, so you, so you are going to go, you're going to do it. All right, you're going to go to the, you're going to go to the party. It's a big party. There's a lot of older kids, but you're going to be able to handle yourself. Okay, I'm going to pick you up when? Okay, eleven. Good. That's fair enough because it, it's you know it's just Thursday and you've got a day of school left. All right. I know you've got two study halls, but still, good. Eleven o'clock. It's a party. Thank you for telling me there's older kids there. That's really good of you. And all right, now here's, and here's why, what I, where I'm building to here. What's your exit strategy? If the party gets too much, if stuff starts going really wrong, what's your walk-off point? You see, a guide planning an ascent on a, on a mountain will always plan the walk-off points. If weather blows in and squalls hit, there's always the walk-off points that are planned. There is a point of no return when you go for the summit, but there are the walk-off points. I've done a lot of expeditionary climbing, and, and you're always planning your walk-off points. Now, I, that also applies to kids going into some areas in their life that you're a little concerned about. But if, you, if they can tell you what their exit 
strategy is. I'll give you an example. I was saying this to a mum in a workshop a couple of weeks ago. And what she said is, that's amazing you say that because I've got this arrangement with my 15-year-old son that he can ring and he can say to me, is the dog okay? And that's code for come pick me up. And I said, that's brilliant because is the dog okay? Even a 15-year-old, there's still 10. No one wants to have a sick dog. And he basically has said to his friends, his plan is, I'm going to say to my friends, my dog is really, really sick and, I need to, and I've rung my mum and it's not doing well. Now, you could say, okay, that's a white lie, but actually I think what he's doing is being very truthful to what's going on inside him. And he said, and he, is the dog okay? And I said, really, has he ever done it? And she said, no, never had to use it. But maybe one day he will. And is the dog okay is my code for, mum, get here quick. And I think that's, and, and, and I've said, so he, he's never had to use it, but has he ever gotten to situations where he should have? And she said, no, because that plan is there. We talk about it beforehand and we're good. Now, I want to add one more piece before we're done with the teenage years. And that's that if you, if, and even the 14, 15 year old, some of you might be parenting kids that age, I want to agree the consequences if something goes wrong ahead of the teenager going into the situation. So let's use the example of the party, 11 o'clock. Okay, good Dwight, 11. All right, yeah, that's fair. That's reasonable. Now I'll be there at eleven, but if you come out, if you're not out at eleven, I, yeah, 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 I'll park the Volvo round the corner. All right, I will. I won't wear the cardigan. Yeah, well, whatever. But the. All right. So, but what happens if you're out? It's like at eleven thirty or midnight, and I'm still sitting there. What's going to happen? You need to tell me what the consequence of that is. You, you, you're, you're 16, Dwight. I don't want to be deciding what the consequence for that is. You need to decide ahead of time. The only thing you've got to be careful of with teenagers of this age is the consequences can be really severe that they think up. You think, no, 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 no. no. Not transportation to Tasmania. You know, it's... it's, it's <laughs> um, what, what is, and so they come up with their own consequences. You agree it. And then when the trouble happens... You don't have to de-evolve your parenting. You don't have to treat the kid like a little kid now because you, just, you kick in the consequence and that's, that's the way it runs. And they don't push back against it because it's their consequence, right? So that's just a, that's just a little bit of it for um, the, the teen years. Now, here's the last piece before we're done with this evening. Yeah, we're, we're in good shape. Is, is that the, the last piece is... If your teenager is not doing well, all right, if they're not being team players, if they're, if they're blowing you off and not telling you their plans, they're being disrespectful, and, and they're not taking other family members into account. And it's not just a little bit, it's a pattern, and you watch it. But these are your four discernment points. Can they tell a plan? Every time I ask them, they just say, I don't know, why do I have to say? Their timing is terrible, they're being disrespectful, and they're actually being very unempathetic. They're not showing empathy towards others, and it's happening over and over and over. My, my, the, the, my advice is that you don't keep in that gardener principle, is that it's, you move the child, as I said, back, right back into that governorship. And you say to, to, to your son or your daughter, you, you know um, what, Martha, for the next three or four weeks, I'm going to be telling you what to do. I'm going to be telling when you can do it, how you can do it. And I'm sorry, but your behavior is showing me that you can't handle the amount of decision-making that I'm giving you. And for at least another month, it's, 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 you know, yep, yep, it's like a nightmare. I agree, the walls are closing in, sweetheart. And yeah, I know, I'm the, I know no other parent does this. Um, and I, I know, I know you, okay, well, uh, therefore it's going to be very quiet around the house, isn't it? Because <laughs> they're never going to talk to you and, and, and they're not going to cooperate with anything. And, and when they pull this one, I'm not going to cooperate with anything, I'm not going to do anything. You say, I know, Martha, I know that's likely to happen. So therefore, it's going to take a lot of energy from me. I'm going to have to do extra things. If you refuse to help, I'm going to have to do extra stuff, aren't I? 
the whole family is going to have to do extra stuff because of the time it takes you to, to get over this. So therefore, I can't drive you anywhere, sweetheart. I can't do anything for you because all my energy is going to be going into to this because you're going to be refusing. It's really good, isn't it? <laughs> no, really. This is so great because you just see the kind of the thing going on behind, like, it's like, well, I might do some things, <laughs> you know, because, but it's true. Really, if, if uh, you've got you've to gotta work with, you know, Stephen Covey's work of, of sphere of influence, sphere of concern. You've got to work within your own sphere of influence. I can't make my 12-year-old son set the table. I cannot. He's big, he's strong, you know, this might be what you're thinking. I can't make him do that. So therefore, if I have to do it, I'll do it cheerfully. But he's not being driven to soccer practice. He is not being taken here. He is not, there's a ton of stuff that's not going to happen because I have to invest my time in doing that stuff that he refuses. That takes you out of, of, of just of, of arguing, set the table. I will not, Dwight, you will so. It gets you out of that, uh, that's the incredible shrinking adult. Nah, ah, yeah, eh, nah, ah. You know, when you get into that kind of thing. No, I'll set the table cheerfully. But Dwight, do you know what that means? Three soccer practices you're not going to. That's a pity. You, right? That's within your sphere of influence. That is a natural consequence. It's a natural outgrowth. It's within your sphere. And the moment he starts kicking in and doing his chores and complying with when he's asked, you've got, all of a sudden, you've got a bunch of extra time to give to him to take him places. And he needs to understand that. You need to verbalize it, tell it him, and say, up to a point, the governor will be watching his people from the tower, you know, and, um, and, when, <laughs> and when you start to kick in like this, guess what? You're going to have a ton more time. This is the tween. This is the tween gesture. The key tween gesture is to take them back and as they start doing well, then start saying, you know what, that's going really well. Danielle, good for you. Good for you. Yep, you really cared for your sister today and I saw it. Yep, well done. It's important that we notice when they start and say, you know, what you have to do is just let me know what your plans are for today and if you tell me respectfully what your plans for after school today are, then you're going to maybe get to do it. You don't tell me your plans for after school. Guess who's getting picked up at 3 o'clock and taken home? So do you want to tell me your plans? Or do you want me just to pick you up? And you could say, well, they're just going to tell the plans just because they, they get what they want. Not really, because they have to do it respectfully, with good timing. Taking It's too hard to fake that one. It's too hard. Thank you. 